Welcome to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco, bringing you interviews with industry experts and regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land your job interviews in 60 days, guaranteed. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Welcome to the Resume Storyteller Podcast. Um, I'm so excited to have with me today Rob Lousy, who is a recruitment consultant, and he has a passion about changing and impacting the recruiting industry to improve both the client and the candidate experience. Before jumping into recruiting, he worked in financial services with Wells Fargo and First Bank of Colorado, where he focused on sales, management, and lending. He joined Titus Talent four years ago, um, and they're a unique recruiting agency that partners with everyone from small to publicly traded companies to place everyone from estimators, project managers, C-suite talent, and more. He is very active on LinkedIn, which is where he and I first connected, and shares blogs and resources for both candidates and hiring managers. He's also passionate about spreading awareness around mental health in the business place. Joel does offer coaching and career consulting to both job seekers and select clients. So, Joel, thank you so much and welcome. Thanks. So great to be here. I appreciate your time and inviting me to come on the show. Super excited to share today. So I thank you for that. Yeah. So I get you heard the brief bio, but I'd love to hear in your words exactly what you do day in and out and how did you come to... Uh, uh, come to the recruiting agency or the cr- recruiting side of the house. Yeah, absolutely. So to give a little bit of a background, in college, I was really focused on the financial world. So I got my degree in finance. And I really had that idea that one day when I grew up, I was going to be a stock trader. I was going to be in the financial industry, helping people. I could have seen myself as a financial advisor. Uh, an underwriter helping people out with loans. I really just just had a passion for for numbers, and that was really educationally where I, I succeeded. I was good at math, really good at conceptually understanding business from the financial point of view. The only struggle that I had ever really in any of my finance finance classes was this other passion, which is just for people connecting yeah. and and having conversations. So. I, you know, I think a lot of people would think of an accountant or a financial person as being a little bit more reserved. Mm-hmm. I'm the complete opposite. I'm in all my finance classes, just chatting up a storm, distracting everybody. <laughs> the extra right. They all- couldn't stand. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's, it's like you have this introverted world in these classrooms where everybody's very reserved. Nobody's really wanting to get to know each other. And then this just guy who's just wanting to talk to everybody and, did well and always, you know, had my hand up for every question and really Mm -hmm. participated. But I think that that was really the beginning of understanding that, yes, I'm good at math. Yes, I'm good at the accounting and finance side. But from a personality standpoint, I'm probably going to annoy anybody (laughs) else that I'm working with. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, I graduated right around the recession too. So those positions, particularly in finance, were extremely extremely challenging to get into yeah, at that time. Yeah, they were. Yeah. And I, I think we're kind of in that time a little bit as well, where there's certain industries that when an economic slowdown occurs, it's just really hard to get into. You've got to know somebody yeah. or you've got to have graduated from a certain school. So, yeah, so I I graduated college and I got my first job in at Wells Fargo. I thought it made sense that I'd be working with more of the consumer clients, more of the kind of retail clients is what we would call it. So worked pretty closely with the tellers at the bank, the financial advisors, and really just acting as that advisor to anybody that would come in and had questions mm-hmm. and, you know, really just sold people on, on um, you know, financial services. Um, again, with my personality, you know, the banking world is so regulated, it's so rigid. So I'm the type of guy that if you put a set of rules, I'm going to try and figure out every way to still be successful without following any of those rules. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, we would Stop have regulation. Banking, yeah. 
it, it's just that classic stuffy banking industry. Yeah. So um, I, I moved out to California about eight years ago, and, and I moved there because I just felt like that was the type of place where people were doing things and continued to work for for the bank. And after about three years of being out there, I just decided to move back to the Milwaukee area. That's where my family is. And I, I just felt like, yeah, this is the time. I need to move back. I've got some family issues going on. And so I just left my job at the bank. And I had no idea really what I was going to do when I got back into town. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, kind of kind of just a big, a big change. I felt like after seven years in the banking industry, this just really isn't for me. And, and you know, seven, in, seven years of being in finance and banking just felt that's it. I, I need to find something else. Well, it's a big leap um, of faith. A big leap of big faith. Leap. Just yeah. Jumped, yeah. jumped in the car, drove 27 hours uh, one one way, didn't take any breaks. And, um, yeah, just really felt like, okay, this is, this is what I need to do. And um, when I got back in the town, I reconnected with a, a longtime mentor of mine who's currently my CEO. And uh, he's a, just a great guy really big supporter, somebody who really takes chances on people and just really believes the best for people. And we started talking. I knew he was in recruitment. I wasn't sure what he was involved with. Last time I had talked to him, he was working for Ronstadt, which is a huge recruiting firm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought, you know, this is probably a good guy to talk to about jobs. And um, in that time period that I had left Wisconsin and kind of gone out to California, right around that same time period, he had I uh, got it, left R- Ronstad, uh, this huge staffing agency, and started working for a, a, a risk and finance company that really helped c- companies manage their risk and finance, but had a lot of clients that were asking about recruiting. And mm-hmm. they saw an opportunity to pick up clients in the recruiting industry. And they headhunted my current CEO and said, we'd love for you to come and be a part of the company. So he ended up working for them. And three years later, they sold the risk side of the company and finance side of the company and started um, this company that I work for right now, which is Titus Talent Strategies. Oh, okay. and, so you uh, were there almost almost from the beginning then. Right from the beginning. So when we, well, I think I was six months into when they had officially broken off and kind of started as, a, as an individual agency. And there were nine people working there when I started. So. Wow. Yeah, pretty small, tight knit group. Okay. And so, who do you? What What is your niche in terms of recruiting? Yeah, that's a great question. So my uh, my focus is really within the construction industry right now. So okay. most of my clients are mid size to large. I'd say kind of large slash mid size general contractors. So they might be doing anywhere from two hundred million dollars a year to I think our biggest client that I work with is doing around a billion dollars a year of, of okay. work. So, that, you know, they're doing pretty large projects. They're not necessarily the big, big players in the game, but typically, um, you know, they're, they're really well known in the area that they're working in. They might have different geographies that they work in. And so that, that would be my focus. And within that, I focus on managing the relationships and then managing the overall project, making sure we're finding good candidates for them, we're, we're placing quality candidates. Okay. And then in terms of candidates, you're talking everything from project engineers and estimators all the way up to the c suite of those organizations? Yeah, exactly. So okay. we probably the most common searches that we work on would be the estimators, project engineers, superintendents. So people okay. who are managing the job either in the field or the office. Yeah. And then occasionally, with some of our clients, we have placed, uh, I've personally placed a president of a region, uh, CFOs, some of those C-suite positions as well. So you see things from both ends. You get to, you know, you know what the clients need, and then you know what uh, candidates are facing. Um, because most of our listeners are on the candidate side. I would love to hear from you. What what are a couple of challenges that you see people that are, you know, that are searching in your industry and are looking to um, to get hired by your clients? Yeah, I, I think 
right now we're in a really unique time as far as the construction industry goes. There's a there's definitely a scarcity of of talent. So most people are are working, you know, and there's not a, a huge active candidate base. But if you are in that candidate base that is active, the biggest question that you're going to face, and and I think this would be probably for most industries right now. The biggest question that a hiring manager would ask me is, why is this person looking? Particularly if they're, um, if, if somebody isn't employed right now, I think the okay. perception from most hiring managers is that's a red flag in a time where everybody's working and everybody's busy. Why is this person you know, not busy? Did they have a problem with their last job? So I think overcoming that initial red flag, so to speak, for hiring manager, that, that's probably the biggest issue. And I don't think that as a candidate, you really get to voice that unless you obviously have a conversation either with a recruiter that's gotten in with a hiring manager, or you're able to con- contact that hiring manager right away and, and really have that conversation with them. So do you recommend that um, people be upfront about any gaps in employment if they had to go and, you know, take leave to take care of, of, you know, an ailing loved one or something like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the best way to handle it is to upfront be, be as transparent as possible. And I, I think if you know that there's red flags that you see either, whether that, you know, whether that's gaps, whether that's a uh, current situation, I, I think you have to be upfront with that. Yeah. Luckily with the construction industry, Gaps are, are fairly common. A lot of people will decide that they want to start their own construction company or they want to take a little bit, bit of a break from the industry and maybe act as a residential GC for a while and open up their right. own business. There's a lot of companies that do start up and fail. So I, I think there's a little bit more of a conversation there within the construction industry. Okay. But, you know, hiring managers, I think, will have these perceptions and the challenges to, through consulting and having conversations to really open them up to the idea that just because somebody's had a gap, it doesn't take away from the skills that they bring or their ability to do the job. So your advice is spell it out, address the red flag, get it off the table as soon as you can. I, I think I think you have to do that. I, you know, yeah. I think if you do that, then you're you're owning it. And I think there's a difference between owning something and then, or somebody recognizing it and having reservations and then asking questions. It's two completely different situations. Yeah. You're more in control if you just own it right away. And yeah, but yeah, you're right. A lot particularly, of people the narrative. It, exactly. And it, you, you know, that's why, that's where you want to be is that, especially as an active candidate or somebody that's really looking to make a move, you want to be in that, control position where you're controlling the conversation and you're not just reacting to questions or red flags that they're seeing, you're proactive about it. Now, on the client side, as well as on the candidate side, is there something that you see that each side has sort of has been surprised by um, during the candidate acquisition process? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think so many times in in recruiting the the surprise is always that you're dealing with people, and I think when you're dealing with people, surprises are always going to come up. So I think from a candidate yeah. side, um, you know, I, I've seen everything from okay, these guys are moving really slow; they're taking a long time. I've also seen the flip side where I've seen offers go out after three days, and candidates oh, surprised really? by how quickly it's gone. Yeah, which. So that, that the surprise is how erratic, how erratic the process is. Yeah. I mean, I had a situation recently, and this was actually outside of construction. This was with a, a really large uh, client of ours, and they put out an offer after two half an hour conversations over the phone. And the candidate was really taken by surprise. And I, I don't think that it gave that the candidate enough time to really process the actual change. And so... The candidate felt very rushed and it, you know, it was definitely as a recruiter, I am really pushing my clients right now and saying, you've got, you you know, you do have to make the the process faster than it usually is because candidates, they don't want to sit around, but this was the first time I'd experienced, you know, a turnaround literally of a week. So 
a phone call on Monday, a phone call on Wednesday, an offer on Friday. And to, to me, I'm like, wow, that's awesome. That's so fast. Like, it, you, you're sure about this candidate. But for the candidate, it was a little bit too overwhelming to where they're like, yeah, I haven't really had a chance to really get to know the hiring manager. I don't really feel like I've had a, a chance to process. And now there's an offer in front of me. So. Yeah. And to your point, whether it's really slow or ridiculously fast, it could be overwhelming or frustrating either way. Um, yeah, is it your exactly. sense that the, and maybe you could just speak to the construction industry, um, that the hiring life cycle is getting a little shorter because for years, you know, I was helping people manage frustrations around how eternally long and how many rounds of interviews are required. Felt like there are just more and more hoops to jump through. Do you feel like there's, that's getting better? I think that in certain situations, it's getting better in terms of, I think, as much as people hate the electronic changes that we're obviously experiencing in our in our culture, I think that that does speed mm-hmm. things up. The challenge that I find with, with speed is even when companies find somebody that checks all the boxes, there's still that desire to have three candidates to make a decision on. And yeah. I think that's really what slows everything down. It's almost like even if some, even if they find somebody that's perfect, matches all the boxes, they still want to have a comparison. But we want choices. And, and sure. I, 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 yeah, and I, and I think that that really slows down the process. So I think it has gotten faster. But you know, really, what what I what I see is a, a huge issue with, within all of that, within the speed and within the time frame. A lot of it is to do with communication. So there's a very there's still a long way to go in terms of candidate experience and just really communication as a whole. So you find a lot of candidates that are just waiting and they have no idea what they're waiting for. Yeah. Expectations haven't been set. And to me, those are easy fixes. You know, you have a conversation with a candidate, you have an interview. Some companies are great saying, you know, give us three to five days. We've, we're interviewing other candidates. Give us three to five days and you'll hear back. A lot of companies are getting better with that, but then there's still that follow through of if you say three to five days, you have to follow through with that. And a lot of companies are still dropping the ball when it comes to the just mm-hmm. the communication. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the I hear that all the time. Um, on both ends. I mean, you know, in certain industries where candidates are a hot commodity, you know, sometimes the go- feeling of being ghosted happens on that end as well. And I've had to deep experience that. And it, it does happen, and I, you know, I can't stand here, or sit here, and say I'm perfect with all candidate follow up. I, I mean, if somebody, there's definitely candidates that do slip through the cracks, and I think I'd be a fool to say I'm perfect with that because you know if I said that, and somebody heard yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That one person will call you. You didn't call me back. They they will call you out, but I, I think you know I, I encourage people. It's you know, you can, as a candidate, you can follow up with people. And, I, you know, I'm the type of recruiter that if somebody follows up to me and I drop the ball, I just admit it. Yeah, sorry, I need to get back to you. This is what's going on. Okay. And I appreciate that. Um, but I also know that in in the, you know, in the recruiting world, especially with headhunters, time is money. And so yeah. a lot of headhunters are really conscious of once you're not valuable to them, they will cut you off. And, uh, that, that's actually one of the things that makes the company that I work for pretty unique. We have a very different billing model, and and it's it's something that you know our CEO really saw an issue with within the within the recruiting world, is particularly the the agency recruiting world. That it was just such a uh-huh. such a money hungry world, and uh, he sought to change that. And the company I work for right now, we we bill for our time. We don't bill for the placement. And that gives us a lot more accountability. We're able to get a better ROI for the client. And it really means that I have the time because I'm getting paid for my time as opposed to getting paid for placement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, you, you have the luxury of time in some ways. Luxury of time. And, you know, we will take, we have, we have that rule really once we're closing up a project, once we get the placement we'll bill an extra couple of hours to really follow up with candidates because we understand that if I'm representing, you know, a really well-known company, 
and I don't follow up with, yeah. with that oh, candidate. That's you, only going to reflect poorly on that company. Yeah, if you give them closure, that's wonderful. Yeah, um, so I'm sure I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations around that too, and it's it's never great when somebody doesn't have that closure, and it's confusing and. Well, I mean, you know, you know and they take it personally because they're they're struggling. So that that extra time cements your relationship. You're right; it, it's a win win for everybody. Absolutely. Um, so I am sure you see your fair share of uh, you've had your fair share of crazy job search war stories and nutty things that have come across your desk. What drives you most nuts when it comes to uh, job seekers or you know candidates that you're that you're, uh, you know, looking for? I, I think that the most, the most stressful thing or the, the kind of the horror stories are some of the issues we've, we've really talked about. And I think ghosting and just cutting off communication, it's happening more and more. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with somebody accepting a counteroffer and communicating that and mm-hmm. giving it the heads up. But what I what I am seeing more of is we'll get an accepted offer, the start date set, and then the person doesn't show up for the start date. I think those are the most... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's, it's, and it, it's, it's <sighs> happening, you know? And, and I think that that's a fear of nobody wants to make that phone call and say, hey, I, you know, I know I said I was really happy about the position and the offer, but my company gave me a better offer or somebody else that I was interviewing with gave me a better offer. People don't like those conversations because people don't want to let people down. But yeah. you, oh do, you do see it now. People don't even show up. And I think those are the true horror stories. It's, it's, it's disappointing for the client, obviously, but then I just think long-term, well, and a lot it's of these expensive industries... Too. Gosh, you spent all that time sourcing that client, that candidate. It, 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 yeah, exactly. And from from our point of view, we again we we bill for our time. So when something like that happens, you end up then with potentially a bill and no placement, which is incredibly frustrating. You lose a lot of the traction that you did have on the search because you've actually stopped yeah. working. And uh, and then you've notified. Uh, yeah, you've let other people know, like, hey, you're not a good fit, and we've gone with someone else. And then you almost have to circle back around with them and say, actually, no, this person didn't. And, and it's just yeah, let me go to my plan B. Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah. so what advice do you have for someone thinking about a candidate looking to make a, a career move? Where do you advise them to start? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great subject. So I... I recently wrote a blog on this too on, on LinkedIn and the way I like to approach a job search would be similar to how you approach a sales process or a sales oh, yeah. um, pipeline. So I, I like to reverse engineer it. So I have a lot of people reach out to me. I'm looking for a job. And the first question is that I always ask is, well, where would you want to work? And I think the more specific that you can be, on where you want to work and what you want to do, the the higher likelihood you have of actually landing that position because otherwise you're either playing the numbers game, which is let's apply yeah. everywhere. Right. If everybody's doing that, then you know, you're going up against thousands of people. But if you don't really have a target, if you don't really have an end goal without that vision and without seeing where you're going to end up, it's really hard then to start start your way there. So a lot of people I talk to are kind of lost in that. I'll say, well, what are five companies you want to work with? Uh, I, I don't know. I guess anywhere. So I think yeah, I'll, do, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Which, which I think that that mentality, it, I understand where that comes from. Obviously you want to be open to lots of different things, but right. Right. And pe- people don't want to, don't want to narrow their, narrow down their options. They don't want to narrow down their options, but I, I guess the best analogy for it would just be in sales where not everybody is your ideal client. And if you approach everybody as your ideal client, it's so overwhelming. And so a lot of times in sales, the best way to approach it is to have top 10, top 20 lists, narrow down the people you need to get in contact with, and then start getting in contact with them. And I think from a, you know, from a company point of view, 
Hiring managers are really, the question that they love to ask is, why does this person want to work for us? And I think if you've narrowed it down already and you're clear on why you want to work for that company, that separates you a lot from other candidates that have that mentality of, oh, I'll work anywhere. And then you're going and saying, no, I specifically picked this company because of these three reasons. I love right. this about your website. I love this about what you're doing. And it's the truth because you only have five companies you want to work with. So. Yeah. And I recommend the same thing. Get a, get a targeted list of, of, of companies or company types. Know what role you'd like in those kind of companies and, and know your exactly. Um, yeah, no, I agree with that. Thank you. Um, so what about someone who is, and I'm sure you get this, where they've been looking for a job for a while and just not going anywhere. Um, where do you recommend they sort of get started on, on fixing what's going on? I, I think the, the hardest thing with that that I've experienced is we all have a sense of pride in who we are and the experiences that we have and even how we approach things. So I think the first step is just taking that serious, hard look at yourself and being humble about it and going, okay, obviously something's not working. That's the first step. I think if you don't get to that point and if you don't actually just accept the fact that maybe you're not doing something right, it becomes very hard to really find any success because you're just going to continue yeah. doing the same things over and over. And I get it. It's, it's hard. And particularly when, you're, when you've got a lot of really valuable experience and you're somebody that really can bring a lot to an organization, you want to have that sense of pride. I understand that. But I think you, you really do have to just look at it and have that honest conversation with yourself and go, something isn't adding up. And then the next step would be to find somebody like yourself, somebody um, like me who's experienced in recruiting that can really coach and guide. And within that, go, not looking at it and going, well, it's because I don't know what I'm doing. It's just understanding that things actually are changing rapidly and people yeah. who are within the industry see it. And it, it, as a recruiter, I'm, I'm having these conversations daily. So I get an inside unique look you need to get with somebody that's having the, that unique perspective. Otherwise, otherwise, it's really hard to look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, I see all of these issues that are, are, are happening. So, so really getting with someone and just remaining humble and understanding that it's probably not you. It's more to do with the overall system that's really the problem. But within that, sometimes you got to adapt to the system to, to really play the system. Yeah. You know, the way you describe it, it reminds me of you could be an expert driver if you don't have – a map to get you there. It doesn't matter how good of a driver you are. Um, so you look at, look to guides and coaches to help you sort of navigate the landscape. Cause you're right. It is changing. And that doesn't detract from the fact that you might be an expert in your, in your industry, your role, and, and you have a lot of fantastic experience and knowledge. You just, you don't know this particular land job search landscape. Well, that's not your thing. Exactly. And I, I noticed on your website too, you do a really good job with explaining, you know, there is a lot of power in the resume. And I think that there is a lot of power in knowing how an ATS reads a resume. And those are things which the only way you could really know that is if you're in the recruiting industry and you're seeing right. it all the time. And I think a lot of people, you know, they take it personally or they say, you know, I do know what I'm doing. And, and again, it's just letting go and going, okay, it's okay for me not to know this because this is yeah. it's not what I, I went to school for. It's not what I'm trained in. It's not what I'm dealing with every day. And um, so I, I, that would be, that would definitely be my first step. step. And then I think okay. the second step with that too, is just being open to potentially something outside of the box. I think people get really have an idea of, of what their ideal role is as well. And I think in talking to somebody who is a career coach or somebody that's experienced, there might be ideas that they have which are different to what you were thinking. And I think it's being open to those ideas. So maybe you're, you're targeting a Fortune 500 company and really your skill set's better for a startup company. Or maybe you're, you're looking at a startup company, but really the flexibility and, and those types of things aren't really your, your strength and you actually need to be in somewhere that's more structured. And I think working through those conversations with a career coach with somebody who's having a lot of those conversations is really going to help you navigate that landscape as well. And 
hone in on, on really what the, the logical targets would be. No, that's a really good point. Um, what about, and I don't know how much you get this, but people that are, they come to you and they say, well, I, you know, I could do this or I could do that. Um, so for my next opportunity, I want to consider a couple of different options. What advice do you have for them in terms of how making them great candidates for your clients? Yeah, I think that that, I mean, that's a, it's a huge challenge, particularly not really from the, I mean, I think it's great if you're a candidate and you're going, Hey, I want to go into a different industry. I want to try something new that, I mean, I love that. I think that actually adds a lot and it will add a lot to the diversity of skills that you'll learn and, it will make you a better candidate down the, the road as well and really even a better person because you're going to just have different experiences. The challenge with that from my point of view is when I'm having a conversation with a hiring manager, most hiring managers want somebody who's already doing the job. And, and it makes sense why they want that. They don't want to take the risk. So a lot of the time, especially in our day and age where you know, the talent scarcity, I am coaching a lot of my clients that maybe you need to think a little bit outside of the box to find an ideal candidate. And we, we can't just look at the resume. We've got to look at the other, the other, the other intangibles. Like what about this person functioning as a part of the team? What about these strengths that they learned in this industry? How would they apply to your industry? So I think that's where working with a recruiter like myself, the right recruiter, obviously, somebody that is looking to consult and looking to help you out and not just looking for a fee. I think yeah. if you're working with someone like that that you really trust, they're going to be your advocate with the hiring manager. And I know I have a lot of those conversations where we're, we'll be in a search for 10 weeks and it's just clear that we're not going to find that 100% match or what they think is 100% match. And so then I might find a candidate that's maybe that 60 to 80 percent match and it's my job then to consult the the client and say look we, we we understand that i could be working on this for two years and never find this person let's open up let's think a little bit outside the box and so i think from a candidate point of view working with someone like myself it's more of a consultant and less of a transactional headhunter is key mm-hmm. again working with a career coach working with someone that is more of an advocate for you. It's going to be helpful. They're going to give you insights. And um, and I think you approach the conversation differently. Maybe you need to start at a different level. And again, it comes back to the humility. And it comes back to, it's a tough pill to swallow for somebody that's been at a certain level to drop down. But I think you have to have that long-term perspective. Believe in yourself that as quick as 18 months, you could get promoted to the level you, you want to be. Do it back up. Yeah. Um, and now in my but, job, yeah as a writer is to try my best to match, to, to, to clearly delineate how 60 to 80% of the skills are transferable for those times when a recruiter has convinced the hiring manager or the hiring manager is, is, is ready to take a little bit of risk on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that's again where, that's your expertise. So you have to go to somebody that knows how to do that. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so. So where do you, so when you know, you're on those long searches and it's not producing people, where do you go to source those outside the box people? Do you go to LinkedIn? Do you post online or a little bit of everything? What, what, what's your, where are you finding people? Yeah. So I, I'd say that the primary sourcing grounds is is LinkedIn. Now that that's really to do with the, the types of positions that I'm hiring for. So I think those higher level positions, I want to say 60 to 70 people at least have some sort of LinkedIn presence. Mm-hmm. Facebook recently changed their privacy settings, making it super hard to source for people. So I don't waste my time on there. I will look at different projects particularly public projects for construction, for example, they'll have listed on there as part of the bid proposal. They'll have it listed oh, who the superintendent okay. is, who the project manager is. So yeah, I think, I think with sourcing, you just, as if from a recruiting standpoint, you just have to constantly be thinking outside the box, constantly trying to figure out ways outside of LinkedIn. But LinkedIn has provided an amazing 
you know, an amazing information tool. And, and, I, and anytime I connect with someone on LinkedIn, I'm trying to make a genuine connection with the person, hopefully candidates that I talk to, you know, see that. I don't connect with everybody, obviously. It's not, you know, you can't really connect with everybody. But when you connect with someone and you get to know them a little bit, then it's asking for referrals for people that might not be on LinkedIn or might be a good fit. And, and, it, and so I think it's just always having that open mind. The, I think the most dangerous thing in, in recruiting is really thinking that you know everything because things are changing so quick. So you just got to. They constantly. really are. My gosh. Yeah. Keeping up. with yeah. all this is, It takes a village. <laughs> it, it does. And I think, you know, again, with the way that our, our company set up, I have the luxury of not competing so much against my team and we work together as a team. So I might have one of the other consultants say, Hey, have you heard of this service that can source emails and phone numbers? Go, no, I've never heard of that. Here it is. And we're not competing against each other for fees. So Fair we do really have that. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, that's, that's helps that's out cool. a lot. Yeah. So I want to shift gears a little bit. This topic comes up. Um, I get it all the time and I'm curious to see if you've seen this impact in your industry. You questions about discrimination work when it comes to age in particular, but also ethnicity, gender, all of that. Um, what are your thoughts on the topic and how do you advise your clients or your candidates? Yeah, this is a uh, huge issue. I, I yeah, mean, first of all, I think <laughs> it, it is. And I, I think that I see a lot of people nowadays saying that these issues don't exist. And I think that's just garbage. Yeah, of course it exists. And I, I think as humans, the world that we live in, we make judgments on people all the time. It's how we are as humans. We'll look at somebody and we are making judgments based on past experiences, based on media, based on whatever we know. And part of that is just who we are as humans. And yeah. I think that that's actually okay. The challenge of it is, is how do you act on those judgments? And I think that's really where we have the decision. Like I can't, I can't go against my own human function and look at somebody and not have a judgment. That happens. Stereotypes, all of that stuff happens. But right. it's how do I act on those stereotypes? Am I genuinely, you know, discounting somebody because of the way they look or based on um, how old they are? You know, on all of those factors. Right, right. And I, I think that that's the real issue. And I so I think. First of all, just accepting the fact that we're going to make judgments. That's okay. It's how do you act on those? And I think from my from my perspective, it, it is a challenge because obviously I'm paid by a client. So I am subject to what my clients are looking for. They're paying me. I'm a partner for them, but I'm really a vendor for them too. So I can consult them as much as I can, but I also have that delicate relationship of they've hired me, they're paying me. And, uh, but yeah, those, those are, I think age is probably the one that I see as really the biggest challenge for people nowadays. I think that's the one that we're seeing so many more issues around. And that's really more related to do, you know, with technology, how fast technology is moving. So I think with age, if you see a more experienced candidate, the assumption is they're not up to date with the time. They can't keep up with technology. They don't, they're, they're not going to be somebody that's going to be quick enough or fast enough to handle the software. They're not going to be able to adapt yeah. to this change. And that is obviously just complete stereotyping. It's complete making an assumption of, of the masses. Now, from a, a candidate point of view, I think there are certain things you can do to kind of help um, to kind of help uh, balance that perception. Number yeah, one, to mitigate it. What advice do you have for them? I think it, I think it's use it, kind of using a little bit of common sense here. So for one one example I think that's it, great is nowadays Gmail is like the email that people have. I mean everybody get rid of your AOL. <laughs> you got to get rid of the AOL or the Hotmail. Uh, I think Yahoo's okay, but I, I think just if it's something as simple as the Gmail to stop a perception, then go with that. Yeah, I think. As far as your social media presence goes, I'm not saying you need to be on TikTok. You know, I'm not saying you need to start a, a TikTok to show that you're emerging yeah. with it, but have your LinkedIn, 
looking like you're, you're, you know how to use it. And, you know, sometimes that's taking a LinkedIn course, you know, those videos and tutorials, how to use LinkedIn. Yeah. You could, you could spend an hour and you could learn a lot of how to, how to really make your profile look good. Yeah. Again, with, with, you know, that'd be, I think Facebook, okay. Our employers checking Facebook. Sure they are. I don't think that's as big a deal, but particularly with LinkedIn, because that is, that is where a lot of recruiters are looking at candidates. So just making sure that you know how to use it. I think really attacking it and showing that you want to learn and you want to keep up with that goes a long way. And then from a personal standpoint, just in, in your own life, I think it's, it is really investing that time into either, you know, you could go as far as to take new courses, you know, maybe in a, in a technological field that, might stretch you a little bit, particularly if you're out of work, that'd be a great way to show. Yeah. You know, so, to, so that you learn some software for some software proficiencies. Exactly. And, and, but again, you can do that on, you could do that on YouTube or you could do it by just reading books. But I, I think whatever you can do to show that you're somebody that can learn, that's going to go a long way. And you just have to almost accept the fact that if you are, past a certain age, which I don't know what that is, but you make that own determination. And I think if yeah. that's the case, then you have to just anticipate that that's the judgments that people are going to make and just do whatever you can to counteract that by showing that you're adaptable, that you're flexible, yeah. which are, you know, which are, are big deals. And, then, you know, I think this, I mean, this was a challenge that I faced 10 years ago coming into the workforce. Everybody had ideas about, millennials and they were making kind of yeah right the, I mean, look, the, the discrimination happens both ways too young too old just basic exactly. ass- blanket assumptions about about generations and you just you got to be careful with that and I, again i think it just comes down to humility again and this is on all angles so i think from hiring managers you got to be you just got to show humility and, and not just make judgments. And I, you know, I think that's just all of us as a whole, but you know, I've, I've heard comments. I've had conversations with candidates where their last frustration in their job was somebody younger than them managing them. And I think that that's where humility comes in and you have to go, okay, it's fine for somebody younger than me to manage me. And it actually shows a lot about who I am if I'm not happy with that, because then you're saying you don't want that person to show discrimination to you, but you're kind of discriminating against them. And so that, that would be kind of, you're, you advise, so you advise candidates if they are, if they were frustrated about, about being managed by someone younger, keep it quiet. Keep, keep it quiet. And, and also yeah. just looking at like, why is that so irritating? And most of the time it's going to come down. It's going to be something where, well, I don't want to report into somebody younger than me. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm a very straightforward person, so I will say, well, you know, why is that? And a lot of times yeah. it's just really within ourselves, so. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, and now on uh, LinkedIn, if you pay for LinkedIn, you can ac- access their courses, and they have all sorts of software courses. You can show that you've gained proficiency in them by taking, um, there's a certification quiz. And I've, I've seen those, I've seen people with uh, certifications from LinkedIn, posted on, on their profiles. And uh, I actually wondered where they were getting those from. So yeah. Those yeah. That's what you get it from the, the you know, when you go to LinkedIn learning. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think really them too. I've, I've, I've been too afraid to try one. I probably should do that, but I have not done it yet. <laughs> Some people who have. Well, there's, and, and there's so many people on LinkedIn. Like I, I think of, uh, there's like Michaela Alexis. I don't know if, if, if that name rings a bell, but she, does a great job at just the basics. I mean, she kind of focuses more, more a little bit on like company LinkedIn, but she is posting just information all the time. Yeah, she's amazing. Like just free yeah. value. And so many people are doing that. So, so I think take those courses, get the certification, but then just always be curious about, Oh, what about this? Or what just, does this do those other candidates that I'm associated with on the sidebar? What do they mean? And what about recommendations? Yeah. What about endorsements? And, it's just being knowledgeable with that, and I think it goes a long way. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I have, I have, I keep in very, I'm constantly monitoring what all the LinkedIn trainers are saying and doing because the platform changes so fast. There's just no way to keep up with it. 
Tell them, like, so hey, follow, hey, follow hey, them. Hey. So let's say someone comes up to you and says, I am getting ready to go start, start a job hunt. What are one or two things I absolutely need to have before I get going? What would you say? I'd say, number one, a good-looking resume. And, I mean, that's just – I think that kind of goes without saying. But, um, yeah, number one, make sure the resume is great. I, I definitely would advise meeting with somebody that is a resume coach or somebody that understands resumes to make sure those keywords are in line. Okay. I think maybe having multiple resumes for multiple positions can be really helpful as well. And then the other one, too, I think that people – drop the ball on a lot is just good references. And I think that the people don't really put that much emphasis on, on references. And a lot of times it's the references they have are just, they're the wrong references. So it'll be like this guy I worked with 10 years ago that I'm friends with. And that's not helpful. Like I think the most powerful references are probably client references. So if there's a client that really likes you, it's going to go a long way because obviously everybody's dealing with clients. So if you've got a client that loves you, it's going to go a long way. And I think, you know, if you are going to use somebody from the past, using somebody within the last five years and somebody that directly managed you is key. Now I understand that if you've been in your position for 10 years, that's not doable, but you, as much as close as you can get to that, you want to make sure it's somebody that's managed you directly and you want to stay away from like coworkers and you want to notify them too. I think that I've seen that be a huge roadblock for people. Yeah, where, don't don't stalk them. <laughs> yeah, and let them know and just say, hey, Dave, I'm going to have some companies calling you because I've had clients that will literally, they won't hire somebody until they get those references. And it takes three weeks to get a hold of the, these, these references because the contact information is not up to date or they're not um, anticipating it. And so you got to give them the heads up on that. And do you find it important or do you find it compelling when someone has references from the last five year client references, or maybe like you said, people that have managed them when they have those as recommendations online on LinkedIn? Yeah. I mean, I, I, for me, it does as a recruiter. I don't know how much that resonates with a hiring manager, but Okay. I do. I I will read through those those recommendations, but I you know it doesn't hold as much weight as to me personally. It doesn't hold as much weight yeah. if someone applies and they say, you know, on the, on the bottom of the reference or when they have their reference list on their resume and it says these three people. I'll look at that and if content, you know, the biggest one to me really is those the clients because I think that's what. Most, at least, uh, you know, in the construction world, when you're making the hire, you want to make sure that the clients you're working with love your work because that's what's yeah. going to keep growing the business. And I'd say that's probably pretty consistent across most industries, you know, unless you're in a real back office type role. But I just, just make sure they're relevant people. I just, okay. you know, I always cringe when I see, like, yeah, it's my high school football coach. And he's thinking, like, oh, that. my gosh. <laughs> Well, you see that, you know, you see that people people have a separate list of names of three current people ready and waiting for a call. Ready and waiting, and okay. and I think it shows like the preparation too, and how much you care and how much you thought about it. And it, but it is something that people do kind of just think is a throwaway. But you'd be surprised how many clients want that, and I think it's increasing more because it's so expensive if you make a bad hire that. Yeah, you, you no, know, that's a really they're willing to I don't think business. anyone's ever brought that to my attention when I asked that question. And thank you so much for adding that. Yeah, no, no worries. That makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, so this is my favorite question. Um, thank you for sharing all of your expertise, but I'd love to hear what is next for you. Anything exciting that you want to share? Yeah, actually. So this it's a little bit outside of my, I, I guess, career path, so to speak. But my, okay. my other passion, which I know I mentioned in the, the bio is this mental health topic within the business place. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's something which I'm seeing a lot more conversation around. And I think with kind of the, the shift that we're seeing in the workforce as a whole, where engagement's becoming a lot more important, particularly with 
millennials, Gen Zs, not to, to put too much of a, uh, I guess, a stereotype there. But I think for people coming into the workforce, there's a lot more of an emphasis of finding a purpose in what you're doing, work-life balance, finding a, a deeper meaning, being understood, mm-hmm. having your voice heard, being a contributor. Those things are, we're seeing those things matter a lot more. And I think mental health, as far as burnout goes, as far as engagement goes, plays a huge role. And so one of my side projects that I'm working on right now, which will probably come to fruition here in the next, I'm aiming for the, you know, before the end of the year is starting a podcast really around entrepreneurism, finding successful business people that have struggled with depression, anxiety, some of those hard okay. subjects, and just really starting the conversation around like how you deal with that, how do you manage that within your own business, if you're running your own business or with coworkers or if you're managing people, like how do you, how do you manage those issues? And the yeah. goal of it is really just to, to demystify, take away some of the negative stigma around those issues. And just that understanding of if you go out through a hard time, it doesn't mean that you're less of a person or you bring less to the table. And I think there's, those stigmas that are around, you know, mental illness in particular, and I think about like depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety. Yeah. Um, they're huge and they hold a lot of people back. And obviously we have a culture of positivity, which is great. Right, but- right, right, right. But it makes it, it makes part. And I do feel like entrepreneurialism can pass it, it, it when people do st- have, have those struggles. It, it, it can help. It can I think it's a little, sometimes it casts a bigger, a harsher spotlight on depression and anxiety. Um, yeah. That it would when you're, you know, in a, in a working with a big company in a, in maybe what feels like a smaller role. I think when all the pressure's on you, it probably magnifies a lot of that. Absolutely. And I know a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs that I've talked to even just about the topic, I think it resonates with them just with how up and down that can be. And I think as a whole, the workforce is sort of transitioning to where there's a lot more people that are thinking about being an entrepreneur, thinking about well, yeah. I mean, the gig economy is huge. It's growing. To me, to me, I mean, I I have like the idea of you know, in the past it was like corporations, and I think in the future I like to think of like cooperations where it's smaller entities actually yeah coming together, focusing on your own strengths. And, but you still, I, I think that's just the big shift is it's, it's like purpose and meaning. And, and obviously there are people who are highly successful in big corporations and that's great. But I think there's now a lot more of a desire, particularly with the internet age and how you can start a business a lot easier. And there's a lot more of an emphasis on that. And I think, again, if you take that full weight of a business and you're an entrepreneur, you can go through some really dark times and really hard yeah. times. So I think it just resonates. So yes, yeah, so I'm really excited well, about I that. Can wait. That's exciting. Do you have a name yet or is that still, still a work in progress? No, I, I have a name and this is, um, I just, I actually just, so, so a little bit of background too. I'm, I've actually been really against social media and, uh, I, I listened to a couple of like TED talks a while back about how social media can be really addictive and it can just, waste a lot of time. And so I just took the stance of social media. It's not for me. I don't want to be involved. Obviously LinkedIn for work was a priority, but outside of that. And so uh, I've, but recently I've just seen that it's a powerful tool. Like if you use it the right way, it's a great way to mm-hmm. reach people. So I've got Instagram out there too. And, and the name of it's crazy successful. And oh, I love uh, that. yeah, so I, I had some positive feedback and thought that sounds cool. And, um, getting together, I've got three guests that I've just, you know, obviously scheduling calls with to, to work on. And, uh, I am hoping to get that out by, like I said, by the end of the year. And, um, that, so that's what I'm most passionate about. Okay. And then obviously within the recruiting world, I think just continuing to work for the company I'm working for. And we've got a great mission. Our mission is to save companies money, get a good ROI, really create long-term partnerships. And, um, yeah. So, and the best thing about this whole thing is my CEO is just incredibly supportive, especially around the mental health topic, which is huge. It's huge to have support from your leadership team because obviously yeah. I'm posting about very sensitive topics. And uh, 
my CEO, Jonathan Reynolds, great guy, just is all about it. And he's just like, yeah, man, this is, this is what's going to help you. And this is about, you know, what you're passionate about. Like, we love that. So just a huge shout out. To oh, him that's too wonderful. It. Oh gosh. I love that. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of so demystifying it. Um, so Joe, what, if people want to reach out to you, tell us where, what social media, where, what's the best place for, best way for people to get in contact with you? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn is, is the best one. It's what I'm most active on as far as um, just work. I'm on there all day. Okay. And um, luckily for me, there's only one Joel Algae in the world. So if you, <laughs> if you the link doesn't work, just put in Google Joel Algae and you will see everything. Apologies for the MySpace page. It's super outdated. I oh, don't know how to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, so don't judge me for that. I was pretty young. But um, yeah, I would say just LinkedIn would be a great way. And then I believe we've got my personal email too. So I do. I have your LinkedIn um, and your email on there. Uh, if your Instagram's up, let us know that as well as Crazy Successful. Is that the name of the site? Yeah. The, um, okay, perfect. Well, Joel, thank yeah, you I'll, so I'll, much. I, I, I love too. your advice. I can't wait to see what comes of, your, of this uh, podcast venture. And it was just such a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, I, pre- I appreciate it too. And awesome, your mission to help job seekers. I love that. And I appreciate you having me on the, the show today. You've been listening to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's skim online readers, hiring and decision makers, go to www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.